This is the current federal developments for the week of September 20th, 2021. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by your State Society of CPAs and by Kaplan Financial Education. This week, we got a couple of things to look at. We'll start by discussing the proposals in the Congress. So we'll do a brief discussion there. Again, they are not law. And as I always want to warn you, whenever we're discussing proposals, they are just that. Please don't go act on them, as I warned you before when we discussed this thing. Had you acted on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act proposals at this stage in the process for them when they came out of Ways and Means, you would have made some major mistakes along the way. And so, therefore, I don't want you to start trying to react to these at this instant, but you should be aware of them. Clients probably want to be aware of what's going on and at least consider the steps you would take if, in fact, it turns out that these proposals do become law. But don't assume they're going to be. That's a major, major error that can be very costly. Wait for the real things to come out. That's when we're going to know what actually happened. We're also going to talk about a couple of other developments. We're going to talk about a couple, in this case, of court cases. The first one is going to be a taxpayer's unfortunate uh, disallowance of an exclusion for any of the awards she received for various damages, including, apparently, as it was alleged in her allegation, uh, a sexual assault that led to certain uh, issues Uh, that required medical treatment, the issue problem became how the illegal settlement award was written. And we'll talk about why that became important for her and why it was an issue and why in legal documents, language tends to matter. And this we've talked about in the previous with regard to the actual Internal Revenue Code. This time it comes back on the actual settlement agreement that she signed. Secondly, we'll talk about a case where the Fifth Circuit supported the tax court's decision on whether this taxpayer was in a trade or business, and then specifically whether loans he had made when he wrote them off could be treated as ordinary losses, or if they were going to be capital losses as just a non-business bad debt. Well, I should say, actually, in this case, it'd be 212 expenses was what they were looking at. They were discussing that way, which would be a major problem. Rather than being above the line, they went below the line. But the court did not agree that the taxpayer should be penalized for the position, finding that the taxpayer had reasonably relied upon a settlement that took place about 30 years earlier with the IRS regarding the same basic activity and whether it was a trade or business. So it was a settlement in a tax court decision, stipulated decision, and whether or not he could rely on that for his position that he had a trader business. Again, not reliance that meant it was a trader business, but reliance that got him out of the 20% penalty for a substantial understatement of tax for the basically the accuracy-related penalty under 6662 and the automatic provision under 6662A2 when that is a substantial understatement that is more than $5,000 And there is not substantial authority or reasonable basis for a decision unless the taxpayer can show reasonable cause for the position he took. So let's talk about what's in ways and means right now. As I said, I always hesitate to do this because I've done this in the past, like with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And if you went back to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act discussion I had after it passed the House, you're going to notice there are some major differences between that bill and what ultimately came out of the Senate. So I think it's really iffy to do that. It's also there is no guarantee any of this becomes law because the whole process may crash and burn just like the attempt to repeal and replace the ACA crashed and burned back in 2018. So, it, you know, again, when you're trying to do things via reconciliation, you have to get unanimity in the party in question or close unanimity. And it's not that easy to do. And it has failed spectacularly not that long ago. Again, it wasn't the Democrats in that case who had the spectacular failure. It was the Republicans. But the mechanics are the same, and the possibility of spectacular failure is just the same. So you need to be aware of that. But let's talk about some of the major things. Now, I think you all know we're talking about raising the corporate tax rate. 
but a large portion of this audience is with small, you know, work with small and medium-sized businesses who probably aren't organized as C corporations. So while that's an issue and one they're going to talk about quite a bit, it's not really one that probably affects huge percentages of your client base or your business. So we're going to kind of skip by that. It's there, realize it's there. And maybe if enough changes are made, we might start considering small C-Corps again, just like we did uh, back before the tax cuts for the Tax Reform Act of 1986. And yes, I've been in practice long enough to remember when S-Corporations were considered to be useless. And why would anybody ever structure that way except to pick up the first few years losses with a new business and then immediately convert to C status? And yes, for many of you, it's like as crazy as that sounds, that was the norm. And there were very, very, very good reasons uh, why you did that. In fact, to be honest, today, uh, I still am not a fan of the S structure aside from the fact that it does some things for FICA, self-employment tax, reduces the impact somewhat. But with that not there, suddenly the S-Corporation does not look nearly as wonderful as some other options. And certainly would look horrid if we got general utilities back, which was what we had back in 1986. That's a history research lesson. For those of you who weren't in practice prior to 1986, you can go look at the general utilities doctrine and that is why we had tons of C corporations, small close C corporations, and we never, ever even vaguely considered using an S except in very unique circumstances. The Tax, the tax Reform Act of 1986 essentially created the swap over to S corporations that we've seen, and so that's been one of the key issues. Now, a number of provisions would be added that would impact various clients. Again, most of these are going to affect clients who have more than 400000 in income. That's kind of the rough oddball cutoff we're using. So be aware of that. There's no guarantee it will not affect a taxpayer below that level. Let's not get into that discussion. But as a practical matter, you're probably going to find the biggest impacts on your clients that have $400,000 of AGI and above, or at least $400,000 of taxable income and above. That's going to be where some of the biggest impacts are going to come. Now, the first one, which is not an income tax issue, is that the gift tax and the estate tax exemption would go back to the pre-TCJA rules. So it would be the $5 million adjusted for inflation, probably close to $6 million would be the issue. We would essentially accelerate the repeal date. Now, by accelerating the repeal date, though, portability would still work. So that does mean that if somebody dies in 2021, because this would not take effect till January 1st of 22, as currently written, and please make it very clear, that's as currently written, um, it could change, but as currently written, it would not take effect until then. If somebody died this year, you could still elect portability and use up the entire $11 million. As well, we know from prior IRS rulings on how the GCJ would work as we exit, you should also be able to give away that $11 million. Now, that to me has always been a more theoretical option for most clients rather than an actual one. Maybe if you're Bill Gates, you know, or, you know, or, you know, in that category, so you're looking at that type of thing, you're Warren Buffett, then maybe 11 million is no big deal, will have virtually no impact on your day-to-day -day life. And so potentially, and I assume probably for them, they probably already did that to get rid of that because it didn't matter. My clients, even if they have, let's say, an estate of, you know, 14, 15 million, and in theory could benefit by doing this now, if they're a married couple, they're not going to be thrilled with giving away 11 million. Uh, you're probably going to have to get to much higher, probably five-figure estates before I think your clients are likely to be comfortable with just handing away the $11 million. They kind of hate that. There would also be major changes that would make it very, very difficult or impossible to use essentially defective grant or trust. They're effectively going to be barred by this. So going forward, you couldn't use that estate planning vehicle. So it means you have to give up. It's more likely you have to give up real control because they attack a lot of ways of the donor retaining control, but making the gift. There are probably going to be some major changes there as well. So yeah, it would probably be a gift of 11 million. You might talk about that with clients this year, maybe less than 11 million. But again, we're still going to have the 6 million exclusion 
So it really only benefits us in most cases on the planning if you could get their gifting above $6 million. And as I say, that's probably going to be a non-starter even for a client who had an estate of $100 million. They're probably still going to say, but what if I need that $6 million? And, you know, you get into that discussion, it's not easy. And to be honest, we get in that discussion because the people we're going to talk with this about are people that either have a lot of years left to live, they don't know what's going to happen, or they're older and they're no longer generating the, you know, they're no longer able to go out there and do whatever they did uh, during their earning years that generated the money and the wealth they have now. So now they're going to go around and it'll be a little tougher. Now, maybe people are, are able to work longer and maybe be less of a problem. You all may know that Clint Eastwood had a movie come out this, this week. Uh, Clint is 92 and is acting in a you know, kind of Western movie. And you know, I know I was watching with somebody whose first concern was he, de- he definitely had a stunt double do all riding on the horses, right? You know, it's like he's 92 years old. You don't want him falling off a horse. But in any event, um, we, we were looking, you know, that, that was kind of interesting. So maybe if you're Clint Eastwood, this is less of a problem. You could earn it back if things went bad. He's still, you know, going into a full-time movie uh, movie gig at 92. But most of my clients at 92 are not currently in a position to do what they did when they were in their 40s, 50s, 60s that generated the fortune. So they're less likely to want to do it. The top rate would drop to 39.6, would go up, I should say, to 39.6, and the level at which it kicks in would come down. We would also see capital gain rates go up. Now, that one would take effect already, so don't worry about that. It's already would already be in place. It uh, kicked over basically a week ago on the 13th of September. We got that. The law is a little unclear whether if you had a gain on the 13th, it is at the 20% max rate or the uh, higher 25% rate. But whichever, if that's days, our only real concern. Uh, the, the description said it would take effect for gains on that date and later at the higher rate, but the law itself has drafted the text of the statute, as in the text of the bill, I should say. It's no longer, it's not a statute yet. The text of the bill would indicate that it would be gains incurred after September 13th unless subject to a binding contract, which there is not a significant change made after September 13th. So, yeah, one of those issues. We'll get into that. So that one's also there. There would be a cap on the maximum 199 cap a deduction. Now, the House version of this is not going to phase out the deduction, as Senator Wyden, chair of the Senate Finance Committee's proposal, would do. Rather, it would just simply say for a married couple, once you've got $500,000 of Section 199 Cap A deduction, uh, that's it. We stop. So that one means that we could have up to $2.5 million of pass-through income. So the 199 changes aren't really going to negatively affect somebody unless on that return you're seeing $2.5 million of pass-through income. If you are, then yes, it would have an impact, but much less of an impact than Senator Wyden's proposal, which would have had those people phased out somewhere in the low six figures, in the well, let's say mid six figures, they would have phased out the deduction entirely. So generally, if you're in that position, you have income above about 400000 or so, you're probably going to, if anything passes, you would root for the House version over the uh, proposal the Senate put out. And there is, for those who have very high modified AGI, there would be a 3% surtax on modified AGI over $5 million for a married couple. Now, as I recall, it's only $4 million, or it is up to $4 million for somebody who's single. So there's one interesting marriage penalty there. Uh, what would effectively be a 3% tax on $3 million, essentially, of extra modified AGI if they got married. If you had two people at $4 million, they wouldn't pay any of this tax if they were just below $4 million. But if they got married, we get their modified AGI up to $8 million. It's there. It is modified AGI, not taxable income. That's important to note. And probably more important to note is it appears that it kicks in for trusts and estates at a much lower number, if I recall my numbers right, at 10000 modified adjusted gross income. That would make estates much more troublesome because also modified adjusted gross income, it would appear, right, it's not going to include 
the deduction for distribution. So there'd be a 3% surtax imposed on estates that have any significant taxable income. Even if that income is distributed to beneficiaries, we'd still get that particular insight. It would also apparently hit estates. And that would mean that it would not make sense to hold a lot of income inside an estate. So that could have a major impact. I would certainly keep an eye on that. I think the trust part of that is the most likely part of that surtax to affect the largest number of people who are listening to this broadcast. Okay, let's go on then to an actual development. Now, again, please remember, none of that is law yet. Don't go making changes based on any of it. I fully expect we know there's a radically different 199 cap a proposal that's in the hands of the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, you know, and let's remember 199 Cap A changed radically when it left the House and went to the Senate and the TCJA, and the Senate version stuck. Um, my guess is the Senate will hold sway again because just like it was for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the party majority in the Senate is narrower. Actually, it's only got they can't lose a vote. While they have not a big majority in the House, they can lose a few votes in the House. So it's probably going to be easier to take the Senate version and sell it to the House than to take the House version and sell it to the Senate, assuming the Senate approves a version. So in conference committee, I would bet the Senate version has a better shot than the House version. Right now, all we've seen is the House version. So we'll go with that. Well, the case up today is a case of Tressler versus Commissioner. TC Summary Opinion 2021 33. It came down on the 13th of September. And what this case deals with is, and I told you when we talked about it before we got started, it was going to be a legal settlement the taxpayer received uh, from Amtrak. And she alleged uh, harassment uh, and even, you know, harassment and sexual abuse uh, includes a very specific incident, right, of what she claimed was a sexual assault. In that case. Now, like most lawsuits, you know, what ends up happening is that when you go to trial, you know, the attorney representing you or when you file the claim, you're going to claim every type of every type of claim under the book that could lead to damages because you never know what a jury or the judge will latch on to. So, again, she claimed for harassment, emotional distress and the sexual assault. And she, you know, would say the sexual assault led to, and we know she had, uh, you know, psychiatric therapy that occurred after this. So the catch was she got her agreement, and the agreement provided for certain issues, but the thing in dispute was $55,000 of the agreement. Now, according to the agreement that she signed with Amtrak, right, to settle the deal, the $55,000 was paid to her for emotional distress. And that's how the settlement worded. Now, later in the settlement, she did waive all claims, essentially all other claims, you know, all claims of any sort were waived by her related to her employment with Amtrak. And so that would have included any claims on the sexual assault that maybe were separate from whatever this $55,000 was paying for. Now, her claim was that this $55,000 uh, should have been non-taxable to her. She's claiming that under Section 104A2, that, you know, under 104, this is excludable. Now, 104 allows an exclusion, and Congress tightened this up a num basically, I think, over a decade ago. They tightened up 104, and it's very clear now that 104 only applies to physical injuries, treatments for, you know, various medical injuries, physical injuries that are received by the taxpayer. And as the court points out, there are a couple of exceptions to that. And, you know, basically the exceptions the court will allow for a settlement, if it's not going to be for physical injuries, that could still get there is if it's emotional distresses attributable to a physical injury or a physical sickness, they're not taxable. Neither are damages not in excess of the amount paid for medical care are exempt from taxation. That relates to the item in question. Now, she claimed that this payment where the emotional distress were attributable to a physical injury or a physical sickness. 
And she said that, you know, this sexual assault had led to physical injuries, and that was part of her allegation. Uh, and the court found her testimony believable on the point and, you know, said, but here's your problem. The agreement that you signed simply said that this was for emotional distress, period. And you'd allege generic emotional distress. You hadn't ever really directly alleged emotional distress coming from physical injuries from the sexual assault. And they're saying, so the problem is we don't really have a linkage here. You just asked for emotional distress in general. And 104 does not exclude emotional distress unless other factors are shown. And she said, well, yeah, but look, this, you know, there was no question, you know, at least and the court said, we, we agreed that assault occurred and that assault and that had physical injuries. We have no reason to doubt you on that point. But the problem was the actual language of your agreement said that these were solely for physical injuries or not for physical injuries, but for emotional distress. Not emotional distress arising from physical injuries, but simple emotional distress. And clearly, emotional distress arises from all kinds of things related to sexual harassment. You know, that psychotherapy arises from lots of issues. That of the other, and just even not the psychotherapy issue, but just generic damages. There's emotional distress to be compensated for, for working in a hostile work environment where the entity was aware of it. Now, we should say that her original claim got tossed out at the trial court. She appealed to the U.S. Court of, US United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit because that's where her claim would have gone to. And uh, this was settled ahead of time. But the court said the problem is the explicit language of your settlement limits the 55000 to emotional distress. And, you know, it's, we, we can't apply it to anything else. Now, however, to the extent that emotional distress led to medical care, you can't exclude that. So they said what we can allow and will is a deduction. Now, unfortunately, this was only for about $6,600 of her, you know, of the entire award. But we can allow you for the $6,600 of psychotherapy uh, expenses you have incurred through the end of 2014. Now, the court said, we understand there may be additional for post-traumatic stress syndrome. There may be additional treatments that will be beyond this point, but it wasn't allocated there. So they're saying, unfortunately, because we have an annual tax system and we have to determine the taxation of the 55000 in the year you received it, we can only consider amounts that were paid by the end of 2014. Uh, the court did not say what would happen in later years if she incurred such expenses. There's That can get to an interesting theory about, you know, would it be some sort of odd claim of right structure? I think that's going to be difficult to sell, but possible. You know, it's, it's like, it, it's very odd to see. Unfortunately, you get concerned her only option may be to go to Schedule A uh, medical deductions and have to clear the AGI limits and itemize. So it may not be great, but as the court says, they don't worry about years other than 14. So she did get the deduction for the psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know, related to this emotional distress, but she did not be, she was not able to exclude anything else. The key here is it's not clear if she was aware that signing this agreement with this language was going to have a major tax impact. Um, you know, it's not clear if anybody gave her counsel on that issue. We don't know. The court never tells us. But it's also very possible that, yes, Amtrak may have had a very good reason, you know, not to want this to go to court and have more publicity about, you know, an employee being sexually assaulted on the job or what, you know, the allegation in question. So, you know, they probably don't want that discussed. And so they might have a reason to not want that to be in the settlement either, you know, to just, we're not going to talk about it uh, in that issue. So it's possible that it also could have been that, you know, maybe they knew that approached them to have this 55 allocated to that, and Amtrak said, no way, we're not admitting to that. You know, we're, we're going to turn down that omission. It's tough to know, but it is important to understand 
uh, I think we've all seen settlements where counsel has given, you know, the counsel working the settlement has given not the world's greatest tax advice on its taxability. Uh, it can be helpful, but also understand there may be reasons you're not going to get the perfect tax result. You're not going to get the perfect, you know, tax language in there because the other party may balk at it. Or they may just simply, you know, not want to spend the time reviewing the whole thing. So it's a take it or leave it, use our language this way. So be aware of that. But clearly this is a case, and we've talked about it before, you know, a couple weeks ago with regard to language of a statute. But whenever you're in legal in a legal proceeding or court, language matters. And you got to be very, very careful. It also means, as we should add here, that you would if you are going to report this on her return, you've got to see the settlement. You can't just take her word for it. Or you can't just take, well, her attorney said this shouldn't be taxable. It's like first thing is, well, the attorney willing to give us a legal opinion on that point. And secondly, you know, we kind of need to know what's in the agreement because that's what's necessary because we know that's the first thing the court's going to look at in order to determine the taxation. Then also, what did you file with the court? What were your claims? What were your complaints? How did you modify things over time? In essence, because the court, if it's ambiguous in the settlement, and that was one of our problems here, it wasn't ambiguous in the settlement. If it's ambiguous in the settlement, then the court turns around and starts looking at other evidence of what this was intended to compensate. And they would look at your claims, at the defenses, at all the various facts and circumstances to arrive at what it appears the award was for. Finally, this week, we're going to consider a case of Ray versus Commissioner. This is a Fifth Circuit case, docket number 260004 from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, came out on April the 14th. Now, Ray here, uh, th 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 this is Mr. Ray. Uh, he had previously been married to a party. They had gotten divorced. But a few years after the divorce, he got into business again with his ex-spouse. She supposedly had this system for dealing with what was commodity trading that was apparently supposed to make a fortune. Okay. Well, he ran it for years. Apparently, she didn't have the money, so he went ahead and put a lot of money into this and did it. It didn't turn out very well, and you know, eventually it turns out that, oh, yeah, she was going to pay him back for the money he put in. You know, she was, He was just loaning her the money to go into this to work initially, and she was going to pay him back. Well, obviously, everything collapses. They eventually negotiate a deal where she's supposed to pay him back principal and interest for a number of years. He also had apparently loaned her money for certain personal issues, and that was also covered by this, needless to say. Uh, she didn't really get around to paying that back. So now, many years later, again, right, sitting in last decade, about 20 years after the deal was done, uh, you know, he eventually has to decide that this is written off. It's a bad, it's an expense, a business expense of the money, the legal fees he incurred to try to pursue this note. And we weren't really talking about the note. I remember now we're talking about the legal fees for the note, that those legal fees he had incurred to try to collect the note unsuccessfully um, were business expenses. And he tried to claim them as a business expense on his tax return. Now, he no, no business income, but he claimed it related back to that old trader business that he had with her. Now, the tax court found that, no, really the nature of your deal was really a just a straight investment. She was going to invest these funds on your behalf, right, using her system, and you were going to participate in the return on those trades. Now, he tried to argue that, oh, he was helping her develop software to do this, but the court found no real evidence presented by him that this was a software business, that he was being compensated for that. It was really purely training. It was really purely a simple investment activity. And so the court found that while the legal fees were still deductible, uh, they didn't agree with, and th this was at the lower court, the tax court, they said, but they're only deductible as 212 expenses, expenses related to the production of income. Now, as you're probably aware, 
even prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and 67G that threw these out entirely, we had major problems with these type of expenses in the past. Uh, big One problem was, of course, you had to itemize. So that means if you can't otherwise itemize, you would immediately lose some of them just getting up to your standard deduction. That was less of a problem prior to TCJA because the standard deduction was much lower. But the second problem, which, uh, which nailed this guy almost certainly, was that those 212 expenses are not deductible under the alternative minimum tax. And if he has a bunch of them, and he paid a lot of legal fees, presumably he was getting nailed by the AMT when we moved them down there. The court did make clear, the uh, Fifth Circuit made clear that, yeah, his tax liabilities were way higher. Once you move those from a deduction on a Schedule C that was showing a loss down to Schedule A as an investment activity expense, which became subject to 2% of AGI limitation. So there's one slice of it off. Also not deductible for AMT that in those days, probably because it's 2014, was a huge issue that capped him. So he essentially got hammered for taxes. Now, the Fifth Circuit agreed with the tax court. This was a 212 activity. He's going to get hammered. He's paying the extra tax. But the tax court had imposed the substantial understatement accuracy-related penalty under 6662, finding that he had no substantial authority for the position because it wasn't a disclosed position, and also finding that he had not, he did not have a reasonable basis for taking this position on the return. Now, the reasonable basis exception generally means the taxpayer has to have acted reasonably given his background, knowledge, etc., had acted reasonably to properly determine the amount of tax that was really due on his return. The taxpayer had said, well, wait, we were examined on this years ago when it was operating, right? And the IRS had raised this same discussion that, hey, wait, this is not a trader business. This is an investment activity. And all expenses should have been deducted as 212 or non-deductible as personal. And while they filed a tax court petition in that case, prior to going to trial, the IRS and the taxpayer had settled the case. And in the settlement, the taxpayer was allowed deductions above the line. Therefore, the only possible reason that worked is because it would be related to a trader business. So he signed a stipulated settlement. They had allowed these deductions. So therefore, they said, well, you know, I relied on the fact that back in this exam on this activity in the 90s, that this was a trade of business. The tax court had said, well, that's not reasonable. That's just a settlement. And as I would say, you know, a lot of times our taxpayers, we settle things in tax exams, not necessarily because we believe we wouldn't prevail in court, but because the cost of attempting to prevail in court is going to be more than the amount in question or at least after you consider the risk that we might not prevail, that's going to be a lot of legal fees to spend. And if the IRS is offering a settlement, maybe we consider it that it's just smarter to take the settlement. We're not conceding our position was wrong, but we're going to take the settlement and pay some tax. And so the tax court said, well, this is the same thing. The IRS just settled. That doesn't mean they actually, we never got adjudicated. We just got a settlement, right, to settle the deal, just like I was talking about with the earlier case. You know, to get that $55,000, we just agreed, you know, to sign this settlement agreement. Signing that agreement did not say that that sexual assault had not taken place, did not say she was not physically injured with that regard. It just was not part of the settlement. That was never adjudicated. The same issue here. This was never adjudicated. However, the tax court, you know, the Fifth Circuit said, we're not sure. You know, tax court, we don't think it was unreasonable for this taxpayer, having had the IRS agree to a settlement that treated the prior activities of trader business, we don't think it's unreasonable for the taxpayer, given his knowledge, his level of experience, his level of expertise, to have assumed that that meant it was reasonable to treat this. To treat this as a trader business was reasonably what would be expected for his proper tax liability. And therefore, IRS, you know, we're saying that, you know, we, we, we don't think that he should be penalized. He acted reasonably in taking this position. Now, as the panel said, we're not going to go to the question whether there was substantial authority or not because we don't have to.
It's irrelevant. Rather, we're going to concede this on reasonable basis. Right? It had a reasonable base, or it was a reasonable, it was just he had a reasonable basis for taking this position, even if it was dead wrong. It's still a reasonable basis. And I remember the Fifth Circuit has essentially agreed it was wrong as a matter of law. You know, it was basically, you know, his position was wrong as a matter of law, but the Fifth Circuit is saying he's not subject to penalties. So it really is essentially a, you know, good way of looking at what reasonable cause is in this case. Now, the one problem with reasonable cause is always is if he got advice for tax professional, this won't necessarily help the professional. Because in many cases, then his reasonable cause be reliance on the advice of a tax professional who said it was okay to rely upon that. Well, we might hold a tax professional to a higher standard. Also, as I write up in the article, if this gentleman had been a tax attorney, he might not have gotten this either. There, the court might have said, well, as a tax attorney, you should have understood the difference between a settlement stipulated decision versus a case that was adjudicated. And you should have known the distinction and you should have understood you couldn't really rely on the on that case that was, you know, the case that was just settled. That wouldn't be something you could rely upon in court. Let's face it, the court didn't follow that. So you should have realized that. And But for somebody who's not trained in the law, uh, you know, they said, no, it seems perfectly reasonable that they might have assumed that was it. Well, this has been the update for this week. Again, we'll see what Congress does, if anything. And if we actually get a reconciliation bill, I'm guessing it's going to drag for a while. And I'm guessing we probably won't know anything about it. Maybe by the 27th of September, because that's the official date that we're supposed to be looking at this, you know, when they're supposed to vote on the other, the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, in the House. And so supposedly that date you know, would force it, in essence, by that date, you need to have placated the parties because otherwise there's a chance that the progressives will bolt the bill, you know, will, will bolt and won't vote for the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, which would be a total collapse of everything. So we'll see. But I have a feeling they'll solve that first problem and then keep working on the second problem. Because the other problem is if, if the progressives essentially blow it up on that date, you know, have they blown up any chance of getting anything for the rest of the year? And so that's your big concern when you start going down that path. So, yeah, it, it's a game of legislative chicken, very similar to uh, the game that we got in the, you know, under the ACA, which we did not get any repeal at the end. You know, when the parties could not come to an agreement that got everybody on board. So, We'll see what happens there. And many believe back then that's really why the TCJA passed was because having looked at the fiasco that was the total blow up, you know, to not look like they were a Keystone cop situation, they couldn't do anything. There was huge pressure to pass the TCJA the next year. How that how that experience influences this experience is going to be interesting to watch. So we'll just keep our eyes on it. Otherwise, I do follow the Connect groups for the Arizona Society, New Jersey, Illinois, um, Minnesota, Washington. I also am, uh, you know, following the discussion groups on Idaho Society of CPAs. So if you have issues, you can post there. My email address, edzollers at currentfulltaxdevelopments.com. And don't forget to check our website for stories as we post them during the week. And look forward to seeing you all next week for more discussions of what's going on in current federal tax developments.